places to go. Um, so what, what I was asked to talk about was a laundry and, you know, obviously women's work in the 18th century and laundry is definitely one of those. Um, washing and cleanliness um, were all very, very important. And um, as a living historian, I've been I've been doing this for 25 years and, uh, you know, one of the things that I hear and see um, a lot of are people who, uh, you know, who are like, oh, you're too clean um, or, you know, gosh, people must have smelled really bad in the 18th century. Um, you know, we have these ideas of what cleanliness was um, in the past um, and, um, and many, a, a lot of it comes um, just from prejudices that have developed against dirt and general uncleanliness um, and this idea then that the, that the past was just dirty um, and you know we have these you know we have these epithets you know you dirty rat um, you know if something is bad it is lousy which comes from lice you know something that is covered in in lice um, and unfortunately, uh, many 19th and 20th century historians have perpetuated these ideas of the of the Georgian era in particular as being very unclean. Um, and you know, we have that too. The the Elizabeth the first. This is one of my favorite things, I guess. Is you know, Elizabeth the first only took a bath once a year, whether she needed it or not. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we've, you know, heard kind of bandied about as well. Um, but uh, recent scholarship, um, especially here at the beginning of the 21st century, has kind of shown us that this may indeed not be the case. Um, you know, and many people will tell us as well that, well, cleanliness wasn't invented until the late 18th century. Um, one uh, 19th century historian tells us, for example, the squalor of Georgian England was a human squalor to which Englishmen had become accustomed by centuries of close acquaintance. By any statistical computation, living standards were low and the customers for such refinements as soap, few. Even those who could afford desirable luxuries were not yet convinced that soap was necessary among them. Um, the self-documentation of everyday activities is notoriously poor. Why would you write about something that happens every day? This is not something that we necessarily will write down. Um, you know, why would you write about the mundane occurrences such as washing your body or shifting, which means in this case, I'm going to use the term shifting, which means changing your undergarments, the linens that are closest to your body. Um, you know, we can be certain that people ate every day. Um, we, they, we know that they got dressed every day. They weren't going about naked. Um, so why then do we assume that they didn't add washing to this? Um, occasionally, we will find um, we will find some diarists who will mention that they did washing. Um, for example, the famous diarist, English diarist Samuel Pepys talks about how at one point he, uh, he leapt out of bed and he got dressed without eating breakfast or washing um, and he went to go visit, uh, visit a friend. So he even says, I, I got out of bed and I didn't even eat and I didn't wash. So if he's saying that he didn't wash that this one time, it meant he did it fairly regularly. Um, judgments on what were clean or what was clean relied on your sensory perception. Um, if an object looked or smelled clean, it was. Uh, you know, have you ever had somebody hand you something and they're like, here, sniff this. Tell me if it smells clean. Um, you know, it's kind of this old thing where it is it, if it smells okay, you can still wear it or you can still do whatever you're going to do with it. Um, language usage of the 18th century gives us these value judgments, for example. Um, things like loathsome, foul, and stinking, uh, or stench, filth, and nastiness kind of denote that something is dirty. Um, and for example, the opposite then of foul, when we see something labeled as clean, it is not just clean, it is sweet. Uh, and this is the single adjective that we see used for anything that might have smelled clean. Um, and those of all classes were often encouraged to be sweet and clean. Um, this often denoted one's character. Uh, for ex advice was often given um, with a strong uh, kind of a strong moral undertone. I'm trying to get my, there we go. 
I have to click the thing, not me. Anyway, um, so we have the strong moral undertone of cleanliness. Um, material and physical cleanliness was essential for physical purity. Uh, for the upper and middling classes, the health, there's a lot of health literature, and this talk is not necessarily about that health literature, but there's a ton of it that's out there. Um, and it's often with, conf with conf given with conflicting advice on how to wash. Do you fully immerse yourself? Do you wash yourself? Do you just rinse yourself? Um, what do you wash yourself with? Um, there's a lot of conflicting advice there, but there's almost always the recommendation that your undergarments be shifted off. Often. For the common sort, um, we do have a piece of advice given by John Wesley, and it was originally written to a friend in 1769 uh, and then published in the Arminian nearly 15 years later. And Wesley tells us, be cleanly. In this, let the Methodist take pattern by the Quakers. Avoid all nastiness, dirt, slovenliness, both in your person, clothes, house, and all about you do not stink above ground. This is a bad fruit of laziness. Use all diligence to be clean. Clean yourself of lice. The, these are proof of uncleanness and laziness. Take pains in this. Do not cut your hair, but clean it and keep it clean. Cure yourself and your family of the itch. To let this run from year to year proves both sloth and uncleanness. So again, this is, of course, this is John Wesley, uh, who, you know, famous Methodist, um, and, you know, he's directly instructing the common people that, hey, be clean, let's be clean. Um, so how exactly does one clean one's person, one's clothes, one's house, and all about you? Um, as my time with y'all is very limited, um, the focus here is on the cleanliness of your clothing. Um, throughout the early modern period, there are these how-to manuals for cooking and cleaning. They're all over. Um, and at the end of this, I, I was talking with Laura earlier, um, I do have a bibliography um, to, to give you some of these primary sources um, that I've pulled from. Um, and this will be attached to the, uh, hopefully, uh, will be attached to, uh, to this re the recording um, from the grist mill. So, how often do we think this advice was followed? And then how do we translate these ideas um, of cleanliness from Britain into the colonies? And can we do that? Um, the picture that you see before you, of course, um, is infamous Hogarth, who you know, we always look to when we look um, at, at, at England and we look at the lower classes in England. And this is his Beer Street and Gin Lane. Um, when we have Gin Lane here, uh, we, you know, we see then this kind of the slovenliness, um, you know, we have the man on here, as you can see, uh, people were probably more shocked by the fact that this man is wearing no stockings, no shirt, he's not wearing those undergarments, um, than they would have been um, by the fact that the woman's breast is bared. Um, so again, you know, the kind of this idea of, you know, cleanliness and your moral character are at play. Um, so in 1688, Randall Holm listed the steps of washing, which really don't appear to have changed too much throughout the, throughout the next 150 years. Um, he lists sorting, soaping, soap suds, scalding, washing, wrenching or blorning, uh, booking or balking, uh, batting or beating the cloths to get the bucking stuff out, Starching, wringing the clothes to force the water out, drying, smoothing or ironing, hanging up to air dry thoroughly. Um, laundry, as you can tell then, <laughs> was an, an incredibly intense and fairly laborious process. Um, some households appeared to have washed about once a month. Uh, diarists will note um, that one diarist noted that uh, the washing was started on Mondays um, with the goal to, re to have completed that process by uh, Friday. Um, if in this, this particular case, the diarist was a parson. Um, and so if Monday fell on a holiday uh, or on a religious uh, day, they didn't, they didn't start washing until Tuesday. Um, other diarists mention that laundry would have been completed fortnightly, so every two weeks, um, some every three weeks. Um, there really doesn't seem to have been a, well, we start on this day and we finish this day, or it has to be done this many days. It really seems to have depended um, 
on how many garments one may have had, especially uh, the shifts um, in shirts. Um, and we can then surmise that people who, who had fewer garments, undergarments to shift, may have not only completed a simpler process um, and or they just simply washed more. Um, on wash days or on wash weeks, it, this was an all hands on deck process. Um, many people uh, in urban areas hired on extra help. There were laundresses uh, who were specifically, uh, who would specifically come to your home to help you complete this process. They would arrive sometimes the night before um, to be ready to work um, at the wee hours of the morning. Um, and many of them would work from about uh, four in the morning until about 10 p.m. Um, and in some cases as well, uh, especially here in the colonies, um, this, this again, this, these tasks were done mostly by enslaved women uh, in, in specific locations, especially uh, in the southern colonies. Um, so let's look a little bit at this laborious process, at this process. Um, first of all, uh, you have to have a lot of wood. Um, wood for fires um, was gathered. Um, you needed water for boiling. Um, you needed water for not just boiling your clothes, but for rinsing, for bucking, and for starching. So you had to haul that. Uh, in larger households, um, a wash house was key. Uh, and in fact, you may see, one may see uh, in, in a house to let or house to rent that has a wash house attached. Um, and they're very specific about a very nice wash, wash house. Um, there is a component two between brewing and washing. Um, sometimes the wash house would be above a brewery, for example, or a, a home brewery. Um, and these wash houses either had a well inside of them with a copper built into a laundry stove or very near some sort of water source. Um, in rare advice to the laundry maid, sometimes it's very difficult to find uh, advice to the laundry maid because people just again assumed that she knew how to do laundry. Um, so this advice to the laundry maid was it was given by a Madam Johnson. Um, she notes that soft water was best for washing um, and it gives she gives several receipts for making hard water soft uh, such as laying chalk in the bottom of a well or pond. Um, another such handbook maintains that clear water was indispensably necessary. Uh, any rain or river water that was collected was often thick and cloudy. Um, and then she notes that, or he, I'm sorry, in this particular case, it was he, uh, notes that care should be taken that the water has been properly settled um, and put into vessels a day or two before the laundry process has been started. Um, Laundry, um, so here again, uh, laundry was often marked. Um, and if laundry was sent out, um, you know, it was kind of you know, sent out by somebody collecting laundry to have it washed, um, these marks ensured that what was taken could be returned. Um, there are occasional incidences of garments uh, that were stolen from laundries or from wash houses, or in particular, uh, these, this laundry, these, these items were stolen from the hospital. Um, and I like at the bottom of this, uh, the, you know, it says here like, um, so all of these items were stolen and uh, the shirts in general belong to the poor people. So you just stole from poor people. That's not very nice of you. Um, don't do that. Um, and so we also see too, um, not only are there a lot of shirts and shifts stolen um, from this smallpox hospital, um, but there are also marked shirts and shifts. And marking was very common um, when you were either doing a lot of laundry within your own home or when you were sending your laundry out. Um, linens were most often marked um, with, uh, it, with uh, silk, uh, silk thread. Oh, I'm sorry, went a little too fast there. Uh, with silk threads, uh, red, blue, um, sometimes black. We see black here um, in the shift that was worn by Anne Van Rensselaer. Um, usually this marking would be at the center front of a garment. Um, this, for example, is right at the center front uh, of the shift neckline. Um, sometimes uh, the, the marking would be at the lower corner, for example, of a shirt. Um, initials, we see initials, we see numbers, we see dates or a combination of these things. Sometimes you'll see initials and a date, the date that the item was, was finished. Um, 
these can be found on numerous extant items. We also do find shifts and charts and things that do not have any markings on them as well. Um, we also see this within the British military context. Um, Bennett Cuthbertson, rest, ugh, sorry, uh, Bennett, oh, I can't say his name. Bennett Cuthbertson, there we go, I got it, uh, recommends that linens be marked with the name of the owner, the number of his regiment and company in a mixture of vermilion and nut oil. And Cuthbertson does note that this will not wash out. And I have actually laundered uh, British shirts marked not original charts, obviously, but uh, reproduction charts marked with vermilion and nut oil. And it's true. I have boiled them. I have done everything possible to these shirts and the, it, the ink remains, which is really, really cool. Um, so anyway, um, Cuthbertson also notes that you're, uh, that the uh, British uh, should be marking their stockings and their shoes as well. Um, not only did they not want the, the laundresses uh, to perhaps take them and sell them away, but they also didn't want soldiers um, to sell them for nefarious purposes. Um, body linens, though, were not the only marked items in a laundry. Um, we also see table and bed linens marked, uh, you know, napkins, tablecloths, sheets and pillowcases, bolsters, things like that. Um, once the laundry had been sorted, uh, it was then soaked. Um, so there is some conflicting evidence here uh, we have in the process. Um, it does appear, well, a, a few handbooks tell us that the best way um, then is to then, just before you boil your clothes, is to soap them. And this is to, then to keep your the stains from setting in. Um, the proper way to do this was that the linen would be wet with warm water and then rubbed all over with soap. Um, the clothes would then be rubbed between the laundress's hands. Um, we have, by the way, no evidence of washboards or scrub boards or anything to that effect from this period. Um, we see them uh, later in the, or in the beginning in the 19th century with kind of a scrub board on a stick. Um, but again, having done this process with my own hands and with the side of a wash tub, that seems to work very, very well to get out stains and to help loosen that dirt. Um, so according to Madam Johnson, again, a good laundry maid uh, let soaked laundry soak in hot water overnight, and then it was thrown into the hot, uh, into the copper wash kettle. Any deviation from this, she admonishes, will fix in the dirt rather than loosen it. Um, we do see uh, John Harrower, uh, who was an indentured servant here, um, or actually he was a dentured servant um, in, I believe in Virginia. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right place. Yep, so um, John Harrower notes when, when he's describing, he's an, again, indentured servant, he's describing the wash process to his wife. He says, they wash here the whitest that I have ever seen. Bef uh, for first they boil all the clothes with soap and then they wash them. And I may put on clean linen every day if I please. Um, so again, most sources are telling us that hot water sets these stains, the clothes should be boiled after rubbing, but Harrower says, well, that's not how they're doing it here. So were they doing it wrong? I don't know. Um, but I don't think there's any, well, I guess there is a wrong way and a right way to do one's laundry, but Harrower was, Harrower was watching something different. Um, as far as soap is concerned, um, I've counted at least 11, 11 different kinds of soap um, so far. Um, occasionally I'll find another one. I'm like, oh, I don't have that one in my list. There's green soap, there's streaked soap, there's Irish soap, there's crown soap. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, and soap was found uh, for sale in both England and the colonies um, and in massive quantities. Um, not only was it imported um, from places like Castile or Marseille um, or, uh, or Italy, Venetian soap, for example, was coming from Italy, obviously Venetian soap. Um, you know, it's also being manufactured here in the colonies too, as seen in this particular uh, advertisement uh, that's made by a um, by a man in Burlington in West New Jersey. Um, and, you know, it's the finest show, soap for washing and shaving that anybody has found. Um, the making of soap is, I'm not going to go into that um, because it's a 
whole other talk on itself um, and in and of itself, a very lengthy talk. Um, but based on the kinds and the amounts of soap that were that was available for purchase, um, one can surmise that most people didn't make their own soap. Um, it is, a, again, in it, itself is a long process. Um, and um, it is it appears to that people were purchasing this soap rather than trying to make it on their own. Um, even when soap was not imported, um, again, it's it's often advertised for sale as part of the Chandler's trade. Got ahead of myself, sorry, got excited. Um, I really, I found this um, recently and I thought this was just a really neat, um, a neat thing where he's saying, hey, uh, great soap made here in West Jersey. Um, in receipt books, again, recipes call for this myriad of soap and wash balls um, and all appear again to start with things like you take your best soap or your best white soap or things like that. So again, soap was, was very common and the laundry maid is also uh, admonished to not waste any soap. Um, so again, you know, making sure that, that this process is as economical as possible. Um, one process to which uh, is interesting um, and uh, seems to begin to fall out of favor um, by the uh, by the third quarter of the 18th century is this process called bucking. Um, this is an image of uh, the only image I've ever seen um, of this bucking process. Um, and of course it's, it's 1849, so it's much, much later. And I just said, it begins to fall out of favor, um, but it's still seen in, in some areas and in particular uh, was, was seen in France um, in the 19th century. Um, but this process usually began, um, you know, uh, with, um, you know, some households had a very specific bucking tub or a basket. Um, Bucking served to break down the grease. Sorry, um, sorry, my phone just rang. Uh, bucking served to break down the grease um, or to loosen dirt and to help whiten yellowed linen. Um, the items then to be laundered were placed in the bottom of a tub, or as you can see in this image here, there is a tub underneath, um, and then a piece of cheesecloth. Cheesecloth was placed over top. Um, ashes were then placed on top of the cloth or were placed inside of the bucking tub. Um, and then hot water was poured atop these ashes. This then gives us lye and the lye is collected, then reheated and then poured through again. Um, we also see the use of chamber lye for bucking. Chamber lye, of course, um, is everybody's favorite urine. Um, it appears to have not been used uh, too often um, but Hannah Woolley will tell us in The Complete Servant Maid in 1677, before that you suffer it, linen cloth, to be washed, lay it all night in urine, the next day rub all the spots in the urine as if you were washing in water, then lay it in more urine another night, um, and then rub it again, and so do until you find they, and this is in particular ink stains, um, be quite out. Uh, so again, it appears that the, the use of chamber lye um, is more for certain types of stains, not for a general type of wash. But um, this great wash, um, what Hannah Glass refers to as this great wash, this extended washing process that includes bucking. Um, we also see too, um, by the mid 18th century, um, less use of a bucking tub and more of the ba a, a bag of ashes that's placed um, in the boiling copper along with the laundry. And so this too was gonna help um, kind of add some more lye to this process to, to break up and loosen the stains. And I've been talking a lot about boiling um, and it's this, this idea of boiling your clothes. So imagine this too as being your hot water wash when you're white, you know, when you're washing your whites. Um, boiling, uh, you know, you use a, a copper kettle on principle of economy, really, um, but any sort of, uh, any sort of, of large vessel will do. Um, we see brass uh, kettles used for washing copper, um, sometimes iron, but usually copper and then occasionally on brass. Uh, for example, um, this was from uh, the Pennsylvania Packet in 1779, um, where the, in this particular instance, the British uh, plundered, 
uh, in Philadelphia, they plundered is an uncommonly heavy red copper wash kettle. Um, and so, you know, some houses had these um, and, and occasionally some did not. Um, the reason that copper was used was because, or at least according to um, some of the early sources, was that less firewood was needed for a copper kettle. Um, when the water was made to boil a small fire, then we'll make this, make the, make it continue to do so. But also one did need to take care to not scorch the laundry. A bad laundress burnt her laundry or scorched it. Um, and there were recipes then that were given um, for taking uh, these scorch marks out just in case you um, weren't very careful with what you were doing. Um, the laundry was often stirred as well in this boiling process um, using sticks. Um, laundress, laundry maids uh, and laundresses were often admonished to make sure that they uh, stirred the clothing uh, with sticks that did not have nails or splinters in them to catch the clothes and then tear holes in them. So again, um, these things obviously were happening, so you had to be really careful and make sure that that was not something um, that could, that would happen. Um, um, other parts of this process, you know, we, we are coming to the end of this process. Uh, we have uh, several rent cycles that are happening as well. Um, occasionally a laundress, again, you know, to get rid of stains um, in this after the process would be instructed to use a brush uh, to work in a stain remover such as lemon juice or vinegar. Um, but this really appears uh, to be more common among uh, fine linens, woolens, silks, um, cottons, um, sometimes a laundry bat or a posser. Um, I don't see a whole lot of possers, which is like a, it's like a, it's like, looks like a three-legged stool on a stick. Um, lots of laundry bats, however, um, but uh, they, occasionally these were used to squeeze water and soap um, through clothing in order to clean it. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, one of the things that we see as well um, is that once this, uh, once this process is complete and then the rinse, um, we have a variety of things then that are added to the rinses, uh, including uh, indigo to blue or bluing um, in order to make whites look whiter. Um, or starching. Um, for example, you see here um, for, out of Annapolis, um, you know, some indigo uh, and fig blue that's used for sale uh, to be used in your, in your laundry. Um, and then um, by 1790, we have a German uh, young woman who was looking for a place as a housekeeper who understands clear starching. Um, bluing, for example, um, Janet Shaw was an English woman, um, and she observed laundry being done in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1776. She uh, wrote that all the clothes, coarse and fine, bed and table linen, lawns, cambrics and muslins, chintz, checks, all are promiscuously thrown into a copper with a quantity of water and a large piece of soap. She's very kind of, uh, you know, so this, is, this is not how this is done. So she's, again, very specific you know, about writing, um, about how she is viewing this laundry that's being done improperly. Um, she said, then, this is set a boiling while a Negro wench turns them over with a stick. Um, and from this, then, um, we can infer that, as I mentioned before, laundry should have been separated before it was boiled. Um, and then Shaw also continues about this laundry process where she gets to this, the bluing. Um, she says, this operation, boiling over, they are taken out, squeezed, and thrown over the pails to dry. They use no calendar. They are, however, much better smoothed when washed. Mrs. Miller showed them how to wash linen by bleaching those of Miss Rutherford, my brother and mine, how different a little labor made them appear. And indeed, the power of the sun was extremely apparent in the immediate recovery of some bed and table linen that has been ruined, so ruined by seawater that I thought them irrevocably lost. Shaw also noted that North Carolinians were the worst washers of linen I ever saw. And though it'd be the country of indigo, they never use blue nor allow the sun to look at them. Um, yes, I, I'm aware I live in North Carolina and I, I always like to say that. I'm not originally from here, so occasionally I'm like, North Carolinians don't know how to do laundry. 
So anyway, um, indigo again is this used as this bluing agent, an optic brightener. Uh, it is added uh, to the final rinse. It's unclear how much indigo should actually be used. Um, a few guidebooks note that enough indigo should be added to make the water sky blue. Um, and in my experience, this is a minute amount of indigo, um, depending on how large your tub is. But I've had a fairly large tub and it's this tiny little amount of indigo. Um, most bluing references here in America are to fig blue or fig indigo. And these appear to have been a lesser grade of indigo. Um, as indigo is a cash crop in the Carolinas, it was readily available in the American colonies. And again, this is why Shaw is kind of shocked that it's not being used while she's watch it, washing or <clears throat> watching this process. Um, stone blue is another term that we see for bluing on occasion. Um, blue could occasionally be added to starch. Um, as noted in Amelia Chambers, The Lady's Best Companion, um, she tells us, uh, Miss Chambers tells us, to moisten the quantity of starch you wish to use according to the quantity of your clothes with water and put as much stone blue as is necessary. When the starch and blue are properly mixed, then let the whole boil together a quarter of an hour or longer, taking care to keep stirring it because that makes it much stiffer and is better for the linen. Such things as you would have, mo have most stiff ought to be put in first into the water and you may weaken the starch by pouring a little water upon it. Starch ought to be boiled in a copper vessel because it requires much boiling and tin is apt to make it burn. Some people mix their starch with allium or gum arabic. Nothing is so good as isinglass and an ounce of it is sufficient to a quarter of the pound. For those of you who are not familiar with ice and glass, they're little fish swim bladders, um, and you can still use them. They're used in, in food preparation as well. You can still buy them. They're clear and they're about this big, and it's a little weird, um, but they're really, really cool. So uh, starch receipts from the period use a variety of items. We see uh, potatoes, rice, wheat, even horse chestnuts um, used uh, to, to create starch. Um, and again, this is going to depend on where you are. For example, rice starch is going to be more common in the southern colonies um, because of rice as a cash crop. Um, and you'll see wheat in other locations as well. Um, once this rinsing and bluing is absolutely complete, the laundry is dried. Um, period images show laundress, laundresses drying laundry in any open space. Um, on wash lines, usually made from linen or hemp rope, um, across tents if you're in a military um, situation. Um, they're hung on fences, they're hung on bushes, um, even laid out in the grass. And, and the sun, of course, is helping to act as a bleaching agent. Um, as I mentioned again with Miss Shaw's comment where she says, you know, the sun helped bleach things that she thought were completely irrevocable. She was not going to be able to wear those garments again because they had been so damaged by salt water or she thought that they had. Um, once this laundry was dry then, or mostly dry, um, the laundress is then faced with a task of ironing or smoothing the linen. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about this one. This is, uh, again, a home that's to be let on the uh, bleach, near the bleach green. Um, so again, this is in the, the, around Philadelphia. Um, this is a public wash house with good water. Um, it's convenient for the washing and whitening of clothes for families in Philadelphia. So again, cities um, would have areas where one could take their clothes to wash them uh, as well as um, to bleach them in a, in a bleaching field. Um, I'm out of order. I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to this. Oh, I'm, I am missing a slide. Hmm, I don't know where it went. Anyway, I'm missing my slide on ironing and I don't know why it's not there or where it went. Um, I just want to was there earlier. that ironing were often redampened. They were dry, but then redampened. Um, and then were either above and beneath. Um, so a glass, 
uh, the glass smoother or a wooden roller or a heated iron um, was then passed over the damp linen, uh, stretching and smoothing the article of clothing or napkin or tablecloth or whatever. So this process, again, um, you don't want your laundry to sit wet for a while either because then you will get mildew and that's a whole nother process that you will have to uh, combat and then you have a, you know, you have milled either mildewed clothing or linens um, and then you're considered a, a bad laundress or housekeeper or whatever you may be. Um, again, there does appear to be a lot of variation in the quality of washing that was done um, in America and in England as well. Um, while linen is the predominant fabric being washed, we also see, um, you know, calicos and chintzes. Um, we see a, a variety, um, even s fine silks are washed very, very carefully, but they are not part of this larger grand wash process. Um, occasionally, we'll also see mention of more unusual methods of laundry. Um, for example, um, you'll see uh, this is um, the washerwomen illustrated from Edward Burt's letters from a gentleman in the north of the north of the country in Scotland uh, to his friend in London. Um, this is called Scots washing, where uh, women were known occasionally um, for uh, pulling up their petticoats and using uh, their feet um, in place of a laundry bat um, in order to kind of um, work the soap uh, and and loosen the uh, loosen the dirt within the uh, within the um, within the fabric. Um, again, uh, Bert says in 1754, uh, women were commonly to be seen by the sides of the river in all parts of Scotland where I have been. Women with their coats, with their petticoats, uh, tucked up, stamping in tubs upon linen by way of washing. Um, we also have seen this, I've also seen this method used in, in a medieval context um, in places like Poland um, and uh, in other parts of Europe, but it continue, appears to have continued, um, at least in Scotland, uh, and even in Wales uh, through the 18th and into the 19th centuries. Um, so that is literally, that is our, that is our process, um, the entire process. Uh, again, there are lots of different uh, variables at play with this, um, whether somebody had the time uh, or the extra, uh, the extra assistance to do this uh, would be, you know, that would, it would all depend on, you know, the entire, on what parts of this process that were done. But we do understand, again, you know, by basically by, by looking at, um, you know, at, at images, at the, you know, at what uh, people are writing about, um, that cleanliness, you know, again, is very important for people of the 18th century. Um, you know, maybe they weren't as clean as we like to be today. And in fact, I, you know, many of us are too clean, um, you know, bathing every day or not just bathing but completely immersing oneself in water every day um, you know is is a luxury um, that people of the past did not have um, and so our idea of cleanliness and our modern idea of cleanliness is not the same um, as the Georgian idea of cleanliness in this particular case um, so I'm going to go ahead and open us up to questions um, and since I am I think I'm finished I think I got through everything I wanted to I did. Okay. Um, so, Laura, I'm going to turn this over to you. And All right. Um, so if you have questions, um, go ahead and type them into the chat, and then we can uh, read those out and start uh, answering any questions you have. I will um, try to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, my, my area, uh, really, again, is military laundry, is British military laundry. So... Um, this is a little different for me, so, yeah. Well, I, while people are thinking of questions that they might have, um, I have a question of, it was soft soap versus hard soap, it, it, something in laundry, or have you come across much of that? Yes, um, you do see, uh, you know, that you do see uh, several uses, um, you know, when you're, especially when you're looking um, at certain stains, it seems to be a stain thing. Um, you know, you know, we, it, 
uh, Castile soaps, the finer soaps were used um, for more delicate garments um, and, you know, just a kind of a general all around, um, you know, sometimes you'll see soft soap being used or just a, a cake of hard soap um, that's kind of being, as Janet Shaw mentions, you just kind of tossed, you know, into the kettle along with everything else uh, where she's like, well, we shouldn't be doing that. That's not how that's done. Um, but yeah, there, there do seem to be this, this variety, and I said 11 different soaps. Um, I don't think all of these soaps were body soaps. These were different soaps for using um, to get out different sorts of stains and, and things like that. There's also black soap, which apparently was made with fish oil, and it smelled like it. That's, well, that leads right into somebody <laughs> asked um, oh. <laughs> of the scents of soaps that were available. Um, for the most part, from what I from what I can understand about uh, about soap for laundry, there is no there's no scent um, for for your general laundry. There might have been um, a scent, or there were you know lavenders, um, rose, um, uh, bergamot. Uh, you know there were th there were scents that were added to wash balls um, that would be used to you know wash your face or to your body. Um, that would probably be used for your finer linens, you know, ladies' linens, for example, caps, um, you know, handkerchiefs, and things like that. But um, from what I have been able to glean, um, it is a completely unscented lye and soap that's being used. But, you know, there's something to be said about that as well. I know I, you know, when I've done my laundry, um, out in the field and it's been, you know, hung out to dry and I bring it in and it has still has that, it has an outdoor scent. It smells like outside. Um, it smells like laundry hung on a line. So um, I think it seems to me that scented soaps were used more for your body and then unscented were used for your, like your, basically your linen, your, your shifts, your shirts, your stockings, your caps, things like that. All right. Um, and then, um, Betsy asks, how were gowns and other outer body clothing washed, especially the silks? Um, silks were, there are, there are ways of getting the stains out. Um, you know, if somebody spilled oil or wine, um, there are, I have, um, yeah, I do have like, uh, when you, you print it out, I printed it out, but sometimes it's just easier, um, you know, that they will go through and give you uh, lemon juice and, you know, fine, you know, and they'll, they'll tell you how to, to t you have to take uh, the, the laces off. Now I will say that is not the laundry maid's job. That is a chambermaid's job. And that is completely different. Um, so there is a lady's maid or a chambermaid um, that, that is also a, a completely separate person, um, and that person is responsible for the finer, uh, the silks, the, um, the laces, the, the thing, you know, even cottons and chintzes seem to have been thrown in, um, in the regular laundry. Um, there are also, um, uh, receipts for if you are using, if you're um, washing uh, printed linen or printed cottons, um, and then how to even um, how to even make sure that the colors don't run, for example. Um, so uh, an example here, when the colors with former bad former washings are run into the white ground, wash the cloth in three lathers, but without putting it into pump water. After that, rinse the cloth and then put it into a pail of soft water mixed with half a pint of the best white wine vinegar, letting it remain there an hour or two, in which time all the colors run into the ground will be discharged and the cloth look clear and fine. Um, so that's obviously those are printed cottons, um, which are again the laundresses, uh, you know, really that laundresses purview that we washed way more often than a silk, for example. My understanding is too that sometimes the better sorts of silk gowns and things would be sent out to a professional that would also yes. re dye the fabric and. Yep you know, kind of take things apart and remake them at the yes. same time that they were cleaning them. There are scourers um, and, you know, and, and there are people too who are professional cleaners, almost not like a dry cleaner, but something like a dry cleaner. Um, and there are definitely people who clean leather breeches. There are, you know, it's just, 
kind of cool too. Um, the guy's like, yeah, I'm a leather breeches cleaner, or he's run away wearing a pair of newly cleaned leather breeches. I'm like, I'm glad that's not my job. <laughs> the, the number of runaway advertisements that say somebody's wearing a pair of greasy leather breeches yeah. makes me yeah. think, yeah, that would be a gross yeah. job. Um, yeah. let's see, somebody, um, Candy asked what, about what age would one become a laundress? Is this an area of work that children would be expected to assist with? Um, in a household and well, in a, in a lower class household, yes. Um, you know, in a middling class household, no. Um, because again, that's, you know, that is your, the job of the laundress or laundry maid, um, that you will, that you will hire out or the enslaved, you know, an, a, somebody who has been enslaved. Um, but again, you know, with, with enslaved children, this may have been a job that they would have started young, um, you know, collecting laundry, you know, soaking it and things like that. Um, again, that is unfortunately, uh, you know, one of those invisible, um, those invisible jobs that we, we don't have a lot of information on. Um, you know, women, uh, there isn't a certain age for a laundress. Um, I was reading the other day about a woman who, um, you know, we, we see most, uh, some women will take in laundry um, to kind of help supplement their husband's incomes. Um, some women also, once they find themselves widowed, um, will become a laundress. Um, there was a woman in London who became a laundress at the age of 66. Um, so, uh, there doesn't seem to have been a, this isn't necessarily a trade. Um, this is something I think that sometimes people will fall into, um, you know, and, and if one does get hired on as a laundry maid, again, it is very hard, very, you know, backbreaking work. And I think um, it would be done um, if it's something that you kind of need to do out of necessity uh, as, as to make money, um, you will probably wait until you are, you know, until you are older to do that. Um, from what I've been able to glean from, uh, from newspapers, most young women are trying to hire themselves out as chambermaids, not as laundry maids. Um, it's a, it's a much more, uh, it's a much more delicate job. It has more status to it. Um, but again, you know, laundry would be something that in, in a, in a common household, in a more common household, um, you know, would have been, uh, you know, learned, you know, you, it is an all hands on deck. The more people that you have doing, you know, hauling water, collecting firewood, it, it, it's, it's going to take you a long process, a long time to do that. And, um, you know, as a kid, you know, growing up in rural area myself, you know, if you needed firewood, everybody went to, you know, go collect, you know, the sticks and he used his kindling. So it was something that everybody did. Uh, Catherine um, says um, that you mentioned your specialty is British military laundry. Um, so what are some of the differences you found between military and civilian? Um, this, the whole process, <laughs> the gigantic process um, seems to, you know, seems to be the main difference. Um, you know, again, if you are laundering for an officer, you are probably gonna go with the bluing and the starching and things like that because they're an officer. Um, but if you're laundering for, you know, for a regiment, then you are probably not going to be doing the bluing and the starching and that whole process. Um, you may not always have access to a well, to boiling, to running water. Um, you're gonna use whatever water source you have at hand, um, a river, um, a pond, um, there are admonitions, you know, that the laundresses need to go downstream um, so that the soaps aren't, the soap isn't running down, you know, through, you know, where people are trying to drink the water, um, you know, from camp. Um, and so, you know, that seems to be really kind of the, the biggest is the, the process which, with which it's done and, and how much time you would have to do that as well. So... Uh, let's see. Uh, Lisa said, I read that people did not wash diapers, but merely dried them by the fireplace. Could this be true? No, um, no, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> one well, of your one pet peeves, huh? 
<laughs> no, and I mean, this is one of those things. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of what I, I've recently drawn, and I don't know, I'm probably backwards, but um, there's this fantastic book that was recently published by Susan North. Uh, it's called Sweet and Clean Bodies and Clothes in Early Modern England. Um, and she does this fantastic job about talking, not just about the process, but what was laundered as well. And she very specifically talks about children and she does mention diapers and she does say one of the things she says is that they were rinsed and then dried but then they were submitted to this entire process and that's because they people didn't want you you can't have urine and fecal residue just sitting around so they would rinse them and dry them but then wash them all at once um so she I, I, that's actually a really great question um and i just read the answer just the other day so <laughs> um so yeah they they did get washed because again um you know i mean i cloth diapered my own kid and i rinsed them and put them in a rinse bucket and then when i was ready to do an entire load of cloth diapers i did an entire load of cloth diapers um so yeah i, I can't imagine oh the smell oh <laughs> and people did. People really did associate things that were dirty with the way it smelled. Um, kind of like today, like, you know, you smell something. Oh, this is fine. It's, it, you know, you pick up, is it smell, smell, still smell good? Yeah, I'll eat it. It's fine. <laughs> oh, well, that was perfect uh, timing for having read that. Um, Michael says um, on the the ladies companion title is that is this a breakdown of the distinction between ordinary women and ladies or was it educating ladies to supervise and direct their households and servants um, so there's several there's several different ways that we see this it's it's really this idea of of being a uh, well, I mean for lack of a better way to put it a housewife uh, housewifery um, it isn't a lady of quality for example but it is a woman um, who who runs her her household as an economic unit um, and that's really um, what this means is this idea um, that the household um, you know again the idea of um, you know of making sure, you know, what are the rules of marketing? How do you choose the best provisions? Um, you know, how do you um, make dishes and, you know, and, and how do you brew ale? Um, again, that using the household as, a, as, an, as an economic unit. And that's, so that's really what these are for. And they're referring to, you know, sometimes we have, uh, for example, one of them is every woman, her own housekeeper or the ladies library. Right, so it's kind of saying again, how do you run your household well uh, without wasting, without um, you know, you know, and, and making sure that it runs smoothly. So it's kind of the its own little like you have if you have a, an economic unit, if you have a business over here, you have a household over here. Um, so it's 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 a little bit like that, and that's one of the things that I've noticed about many um, of these kind of how-to manuals. Um, you know, it's a you know that Madam Johnson's uh, Madam Johnson presents, for example, every young woman's companion in useful and universal knowledge. So again, it's this idea of these are the things that you should know. Um, every woman should know um, from the up from the highest echelons, you know, down to the lowest. Roma asked, um, what, what items were starched? Like were shirts starched? They've heard that caps were starched, but what yes. other types of garments? Um, well, definitely, uh, I, you know, I mean, anything that was rinsed was often, would often have starched. Things that you needed more highly starched, like a cap, um, or perhaps a good apron would go in the starch water first. Um, because as you rinse and as you, you know, as you put more things in that starch water, the, it's going to, the amount of starch is going to decrease. Um, so the last thing that you may put into the starch process would probably be stockings, um, because you do need to, you know, I mean, you don't want your stockings to stand up by your set by themselves, or maybe you do, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but it appears that again, you're, the things that do need to be more heavily starched, uh, shirts, for example, or, uh, a next, like a, like a handkerchief that has has, or a neck stock that has all those little fine little pleats in them, that's going to need to be starched in order to get that nice and smooth and to reset all those pleats. Um, so again, it's going to depend on the amount of things that you have um, and what you are washing at that time. 
And uh, Courtney asks, were clothes folded with lavender? I'm guessing she's asking about using lavender as a as a scent. Fresh. Um, maybe. Um, I've not ever seen that, but again, um, I I don't know. Um, that is not something that I have run across. Um, I've never seen anybody talking about folding clothes. Nobody talks about folding clothes, ironing, mm -hmm, but not folding them and how to fold them and what, how you should fold them. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, that doesn't mean it isn't out there somewhere. Um, I just, I haven't, I have not seen that. Um, maybe they did. Um, or maybe again, if they're using a lavender scented soap or wash ball, then that would be something else as well. So, but I, I don't know. Um, Courtney asks um, if you have a picture of a glass ironing tool. I do. And that's where my slide, that's the slide that I was like, ah, oh! <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I'm missing a slide. I'm sorry. I do. It's, it's a, it's a really odd looking, really odd looking tool. Um, and they appear to be the exact same from about 1500 to about 1800. Um, they have not changed. Um, and in fact, uh, I have a, a friend um, uh, who is a, a 18th century paint maker and he you know, takes the pigments and he creates paint and he uses a glass tool to mix the paints that looks exactly like a smoothing tool for laundry. And I'm like, oh, I need one of those. <laughs> so, but I don't know how common those were here in America. I've seen them in archaeological contexts from London and from England. I don't know how common they are here. Um, and that's a very good question. And um, what I will do as well, Laura, is I will go in and see if I can find my lost. Uh, I will go in and see if I can find my lost slide. Oh, okay. um, and I will send you that PowerPoint as a PDF. And then you can upload that as if, if that's OK. Um, that you can upload that as well so that people can also see those images a little closer. Yep. Awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, Cheryl asks, how did laundry maids avoid the long-term effects of soap on their health, especially lies and harsh soaps? Um, she suspects their skin would become dry and broken and breathing in the, the hot soapy air wouldn't be good. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure that it was not something that, uh, that one could do for a very long time. Um, you know, any soap, it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of soap you use will dry out your skin. I mean, you just have to use, you know, soap, wash your, wash your hands a lot um, in the winter. And I spent a lot of time washing my hands this past year. So I was an in-person teacher and I was like always washing my hands. It's like, you know, Lady Macbeth, right? <laughs> and sorry. And like, and my hands got dry and cracked, especially in the winter time. Um, lye soap doesn't seem to have any other, I mean, it is, it is a soap, and it has the same effects as any other soap. Um, you know, it if it is allowed to uh, cure properly, it's it's not any more caustic than your average, you know, Castile soap, for example, which is made uh, again with lye and olive oil. Um, it's just, you know, I think it's it's this idea that if if lye soap is not cured properly, it will the lye will burn your skin. Um, but yeah, I mean, you are going to get with your hands in water and soap all day, you are going to get cracked and chapped skin. It's going to be painful. Um, you know, inhaling that constant smoke, um, the fumes, I mean, any job has its hazards um, and that's definitely going to be one of them. Um, now, that doesn't appear, we don't seem to have kind of the large scale laundries um, that you'll get kind of later, like in the in the Victorian and in the in more industrial period where, you know, for example, you have the Magdalene laundries where, you know, women will go and they'll, you know, they'll have to work in them for the rest of their lives, um, you know, but because it doesn't seem to have been done on an industrial scale, um, you know, there's probably less of a chance of continuously inhaling um, soap and, you know, and all of the other stuff with that. But, you know, you also have smog and wood smoke and everything else that you're kind of being, uh, that you're, that you're 
that's being thrown at you all day. It's probably more physical that you're going to end up with um, arthritis early, you know, aches and pains. Those are probably going to be your more common injury burns. Um, those will probably be your more common injuries that you will see um, with the, the profession for people who are professional, for lack of a better way to put it, laundress. Uh, I think that's all of the specific questions we've got um, for the program. Got a couple of folks uh, giving you well done. And yes, thank you very much. This uh, was extremely uh, enjoyable and informative.